Robin, you appear to have beaten your colleagues to the punch tonight. You're sitting there very patiently. Right, well, I did not realize they were in person. I just didn't even think to look at it because I'm so used to um, Zoom meetings. And um, also with the mass mandate, I just didn't think, you know, you would, I, I don't know, so. So they're actually in person. I didn't even know that, all right. Yeah. You know, when I when I drove to by town hall, I was like, "Wow, there are a lot of cars here." So. <laughs> well, you, you, I'll defend you because I didn't see it either. All right, thanks, Dave. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you just get so used to it. You do. I, it, it's routine, right? And then once right. you're in this routine, it's so hard to go back to the regular one. Right, and it's very convenient. So. Yeah. Hey, I've got a question for you. How flat is that trail that where you go in and walk your dog into the woods? So it's very, it's steep going down into Rocky Woods. Okay, it, it, that's what I thought. It, so that was a job. I've been on that trail once, but it was a while ago. So I just wanted to double check. Um, my dogs are in need of, of walking. Uh, one is getting... Um, Quite overweight, so it's time to <laughs> time to get him out there. Yeah, my dog Tori's meniscus, so Ooh. yeah. Sur surgery? Well, we don't know. It there's a th two month wait to get an orthopedic evaluation. Two months. Mm-hmm. Wow. So the Ooh. first appointment I could get um, was November 8th. And if I wait to go to Angel, it's December 3rd. Uh, who's, who's your vet, if I may? Holly Kelsey. Oh, okay, good. So that's who we use. So uh, I was going to say call Holly, because if anyone can pull it off, it's Holly. <laughs> right. Oh, boy. Yeah. So is, is the dog just in pain? Like, what do you do? It's hard to know. I mean, he just, he doesn't put weight on his back leg. Um, you know, he, at first, and then when he warms up, he puts weight on it. So, you know, even for her, it was hard to know what's going on. That's why she wanted an orthopedic evaluation. And if you walk him too much, then he he's back right leg is definitely somewhat lame. Oh, I'm, I'm really sorry to hear that. I mean, it's, it's a, a beautiful dog. Yeah, and you know, Holly, Holly said, this is what happens when you have an athlete as a dog. <laughs> She's never said that about our two slugs. They're just going- Your dogs are beautiful. They don't run around outside? Well, they do. Um, and, and they just ran a lot on the beach. Um, but uh, we just, we noted that the thunder is ripping you know, up and down and lightning is just kind of lagging and doing two thirds unless something really good is found. You know, okay. So he, he just needs to get some, uh, some more exercise. You have the sheep next door. Those, those aren't interesting to him. Oh, the thunder chases them up and down and back and forth and uh, not as good as the horses though. When Fred Muzzy uh, was still with us and he boarded horses, mm -hmm. most years there would be a horse that would want to play with the dogs. Wow. And nothing more fun than watching a horse and a dog each on the side of the fence go tearing down as fast as they could, slam on the brakes, reverse and repeat. And they would do it for 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. So... Oof. It's 6.32. Well, I just, I hope that, uh, that they're not waiting for you, but let's wait a few minutes for Rob. Oh, I talked to, I talked to Chris and told him. Okay, good. I didn't pay attention to the agenda.
There they are. We're muted on the recording. Kate, no? Kathy, can you hear us? Yep, she can hear. Okay. Did you get the warrant, Kathy? Robin, can you hear us? I can. You can. You're out. We're live. Right, We're good. live. Then let's begin. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the September 23rd Board of Selectmen meeting. We are back in the Great Hall. In Some of us. I'm in the Great Hall. For the first time in 18 months. So welcome, everyone. We're doing the meeting a little bit differently this evening. We're live. Bob Springett, member of the Board of Selectmen, is here. Robin Hunter is remote. So we're going to start somewhat like we have done in the past 18 months, where we're going to remind everyone that the meeting is being conducted both live here and remote. And Robin Hunter, member of the Board of Selectmen, Robin, would you please indicate by saying present or here that you are part of the meeting? Present. Thank you very much. And we're being recorded on Facebook. So I'll remind everyone to please be sure not to share your screen. For those that are participating at home, I did hear Dave Havilan. Um, I know there are others. Kathy, Kathy is uh, remote. Here in the room with us this evening is Chris Dwelly. Kate O'Brien, Dave Sullivan, we have a couple of other speakers that'll be with us. Jerry Lane is here, Felicia Hoffman's here, Carl Valenti is here. So we are, as I said, we're conducting the meeting both live here and remote. So welcome again. Kate, this is the portion of the meeting for Citizen Speak. Has anyone um, written, called online for a citizen's comment? Terrific, thank you. Uh, John. Um, there's a hand raised and on the it's board. No, no. It's citizens comments, it's over, right? It's I can't it. see. That's Jerry. Jerry. Okay, I, can I, I just have a short announcement. If you'd let me share my screen for one second or 10 seconds. We, in, we are in citizens comment. Jerry, yes. is this That's a citizens it. comment? This is a citizens comment. <laughs> Please go right ahead. I just like to show something, that's all. I'm sorry. I, I guess I can't share my screen just to just to demonstrate something. That's fine. I just wanted to make it, everyone aware who is watching this or will be watching this that October 5th, there will be a influenza vaccination clinic at the highway garage, just like last year, drive through pretty much contactless. We'll start this year at 11 a.m. And we hope to have easily as many as we did last year, well over 400. And we welcome anybody and everybody 12 years and up. So again, October 5th, starting at 11 o'clock in the morning. And there will be registration information published by Monday. Thank you, Jerry. Anything else to add or is that it? No, I, other than I, I strongly urge everybody to, to, in fact, be vaccinated against the, against the influenza because last year with everyone essentially uh, keeping at home, uh, we're not sure how serious a spread there will be this year. The predictions are that it could be very considerable. And obviously, the last thing you want to do in this environment is take on yet another illness. Thank you very much, Jerry. I, I'd just like to remind everyone that was Jerry Clark, who is the chairman of the Board of Health in Dover, Massachusetts. Thank you, sir. We're gonna move on to our first item, the community center building project and discussion of borrowing. And our presenter is Carl Valente. Carl, how are you this evening? Mr. Chairman, Mr. Sprague, nice to be back again, Ms. Hunter. You're joined by Jerry Lane. I'm drawn by, yes, our treasure collector, Jerry Lane. Um, and we wanted to have an initial discussion um, with the board 
about the borrowing that we'll be doing for the community center uh, project, Carroll Community Center project, which I know uh, Mr. Spriggett and others have been working on for two or three years now. Um, <clears throat> so it's now you know time. I know you have you're going out to bid soon for the project. And so um, we wanted to have an initial discussion with the board um, about the timing of doing that borrowing. Um, we're not looking for any decision tonight. We wanted to just open up the sort of the issues. Um, the reason that we are coming before you is we're in an environment where we expect interest rates to increase over the next um, probably three to nine months. Um, so we may have an opportunity to, to borrow at more favorable rates if we can borrow earlier than if we would um, push this off to a later time. Under a sort of a traditional environment, um, we would probably be doing the, the long-term borrowing, um, you know, probably 12 or 15 months from now at the end of the project. And we would only do short-term borrowing, a ban um, now. That's sort of the traditional way of doing it. But given that we're likely in an increasing interest rate environment, um, again, it may make sense uh, to save on borrowing costs to do the bond, the long-term borrowing, um, not necessarily 100% of it, but some substantial percent of it, doing it earlier. Um, um, so there's really three issues that you'll need to think about as we um, get ready for this borrowing. Um, the first is um, when, when to issue the debt. Um, so the sort of the earliest we could do it, we could be ready to issue the debt would be December. It takes us six to eight weeks is the process. So that would be the absolute earliest we could issue debt, um, whether it be short term or long term. Um, the latest we'd have to issue some debt would be by June 30, um, because we're spending money this fiscal year. Um, so again, whether it's a bond or a ban, we'd have to issue something to cover what we're spending now, um, no later than, than June 30. So that's sort of the parameters on the timing. Um, the, the second issue is second issue is how much um, debt to issue. Um, again, if we go short term, a ban, um, we would look at the cash flow of the project and you know, base the borrowing on, on the cash flow, which we, which we have from your project manager. We do have a cash flow for the project. Um, so um, that's sort of one guidepost. Um, if we issue the bond, the long-term debt, if the board wants to do that upfront, um, what Jerry and I have discussed is probably recommending that we issue you know, maybe between 65 and 75 percent of the total authorization of the 18 million 850 um, up front. And again, to take advantage of the lower interest rates um, that are occurring right now. Um, so that's sort of the parameters on, on how much uh, to issue. Um, and uh, you know, the last issue is do we issue bans or bonds? Um, you know, that's partially dependent on the timing that you decide on. Um, the amount of work the town has to go through for either a ban or a bond is about the same. So it doesn't affect the work we do. Um, the issuance cost, so what we have to pay to issue is about the same. Bans are a little bit less, but um, the cost for our financial advisor, the count, cost for our bond council, um, the cost for the Moody's credit rating, that's all about the same, um, regardless of whether we issue a ban or a bond. Um, so that's um, sort of the background and sort of what, what we're starting to talk about here. What we'd like to suggest is come back before you again in October. Um, our understanding is you're gonna have a revised cost estimate then. Um, and assuming that revised cost estimate is still well within the budget that town meeting approved, um, then we just need to you know, look at these three issues and with some more specificity decide on you know, ban versus bond, um, how soon to issue and 
how much to issue. Thank you very much, Carl. I, I, um, our assistant town administrator, uh, Dave Havlin, is on on the call on in the meeting as well. And um, he, moderator. Uh, Robin, what? He's the moderator, assistant town moderator. Said administrator. Typically, Robin would be elbowing me at this point in time, being remote. Be social distance. Yeah. God, is that a promotion or a demotion? A promotion, Dave. Absolutely. <laughs> Sorry. Kate, I meant to say moderator, not administrator. And Dave, I know that as you're listening intently, you're saying, John, you should explain that ban is a bond anticipation note. And so for those that are just you know wondering about the technology of the technology, the terminology, um, the bond, the ban is a bond anticipation note. And we will obviously in anticipation of the borrowing, the ban is what you would use prior to. So to cover short term. To cover short term obligations expenses. and expenses. Um, so Dave, I'm sure you were thinking of that, but um, Jerry, is there anything that you would like to add um, in addition to what Carl has brought to us? Uh, no, it's just that interest rates are significantly lower than where they were in, you know, three years ago to, you know, sort of the, the regular run of things. They are moving up, and if you've watched the news, you know the Fed is talking that they will be backing off on their uh, support for things as they see the economy approved, which will tend to have interest rates moving up, which is why both our FA and, and internally, we're thinking that some borrowing early would end up in net savings. Great. Agreed. Robin, would you like to add anything? No, I, I think what Carl and Jerry have both said is definitely what I'm seeing as well. So makes sense to me. Thank you, Bob. I don't know. I think it, it's whether it's common knowledge or not. <clears throat> Everybody's been anticipating an increase in interest rates for a while. A lot of money floating around in the economy right now in the Fed, as you said, Jerry clearly going to change course in, in uh, 2022. So I guess when is soon to answer your question when? Um, yeah, Jerome Powell has been asked that question probably a hundred times in the past month or two, um, when the Fed will begin tapering. So so I had, a, I had a question about, part of it is sort of a, a cost benefit side to it. Um, we're trading by borrowing a certain amount of money now. Let's assume you suggested 65 or 75 percent of the authorized amount that the town voted back in June. Um, and if we and if we augmented that later, you said the costs. So, what are the costs for um, bonding or banding? Do you want to speak to that? Yeah. So the the. Um, the two main costs for um, issuing a bond is the financial advisor fee and bond council's opinion fee. Uh, that is in the forty to forty-five thousand dollar range for each. Then the Moody's opinion is about twenty-five thousand, and then there's a bunch of smaller. So it's about for an 18 and a half, you know, 18.8 .8 million dollar bond, it is about 120,000. And Carl has said earlier that it's the, the fee is about the same for whether you're banned or whether you're it, it'll be a, a, a little less for the band, but remember the band will then have to be converted to a bond. So it kind of washes out. Okay, so and we would we would also pay a little bit more to split the sale in two and do an early piece and a later piece. Yep. But we should more than make up any additional cost on interest savings. All right, so let me ask the, so this is a John question because he's really a math quiz, math whiz quiz. The, um, what's a one quarter percent change in interest rates on 18.9 million? What would that, what would we, what would that cost us in interest? Per month? <laughs> yeah, you could give it to me hourly if you want. Well, it's fifty-six thousand bucks a year, 
So it's going to be uh, Dave Havlin's doing it on his calculator as a <laughs> thousand dollars ballpark a year per month month so that's seventy two thousand roughly yeah and, Dave, the, and the cost is so yeah, one Dave finished so, three, level three cfa a lot faster than i did so <laughs> <laughs> so the off so so at one percent what's that one percent a quarter percent quarter percent so a quarter percent inch rate raise in the rates will basically offset the costs yep and, right is that right uh Almost, yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and by the way, <laughs> rates will change. Yeah, quarter percent. And and we going out to eighteen million. Remember, is was a forty percent increase in the original cost. So oh, because of the we'll market probably, disruption. Because of market disruptions and, and and raw materials costs and increase in costs and 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 everything, which will probably come down. That's the hope. The hope. I shouldn't say that. I the hope is it comes down. I mean, right now, I still there's still reports of lots of disruption uh, in in the market globally on various and different things. But right. that that question, that uncertainty in final price, is why we are only recommending, you know, sixty five to seventy five percent, as opposed to saying let's borrow the whole eighteen million dollars and. And deal with the problem of if we have uh, you know money left over when we're done, two years down the road, because that that's a, another set of issues that we don't have to go to. Got it. I I agree. I, I think that well we can we can cover that in, in October. But um, anything else, Carl? Nope. This is again mostly a, a preview discussion for the board. Thank you. Um, but again, in a, in October, we will need some answers to those three questions. So, the, so Robin, do, do you do you you want to you want to speak up and tell us what you think, please? I, I said I said I I agree. I think it makes sense to um, to borrow some at this point, or in October. I think you know. Hopefully, Bob, by the October meeting, we will have some indication of what the price might be? I, my understanding, Robin, is that the, 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 uh, the project team of the building committee is going to, or the project the, uh, is going to look at costs the last week of September. Okay. And I think they're supposed to be presented at the October 3rd building committee. I, I've texted board to see if, the, if that was correct. So take that with a grain of salt. Um, but that, that's my understanding about when that information should be uh, available. Um, I, I, I was thinking, I, actually I was thinking about this coming to the meeting and the original estimate of the project was $13 million. We got, we got slammed with the cost increase due to market disruption brought it up to $18 million. Uh, Ford's reasonably comfortable that we could, that the project would, would you know, be on, 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 uh, on target. Actually, it's 18.9 million. And I, I was fooling around and I said, well, 15 million is probably not a bad number to go with. Um, and it turns out that I was thinking 20 million and three quarters of 20 million is roughly 15 million. So um, I would be comfortable with that kind of a range. No, oh, I think that makes sense. And, you know, and we can see what happens with actual prices, but it makes sense to lock in the lower interest rates now for part of it or, or a majority of it. I guess that <clears throat> reminds me just of one other issue. Um, when we, when you went to town meeting and we had prepared some modeling about the cost of this over 20 years and how it would impact the average residential taxpayer and people with homes of different values. Um, for that modeling, we used a very conservative interest rate of three and a half percent. I think right now, if we, if we were to sell today, I think rates would be around two and a quarter. Uh, so it's unlikely that we'll even be as high as what we were modeling. We'll probably still come in. You know, if the, when the Fed raises money, they raises rates, they tend to go in, in you know, quarter percent increments. Um, 
you know, so I would suspect we're still going to come in below what we have modeled for you at town meeting. So the annual cost should should still end up less than we had. That would be good news for the residents, wouldn't it? It would be. <laughs> it would be. So Carl, thank you very much. Jerry, thank yeah, you. Yep. Do you have more? No, that's no. it. Um, I, I was remiss by the at, at the beginning of, of this presentation, Carl. Thank you. I, I um, should have reminded people that Carl Valenti is our acting finance director. Carl Valenti has been our interim, was our interim town administrator, served as town administrator for uh, Lexington prior to retirement, yes. prior to that, Weston, and prior to that, Bob, do you remember? I do not. <laughs> oh, God, come on. Um, Lexington, Weston, and prior was, to that. I was your neighbor in Needham. Needham, Needham. yep. That's where I got to know a lot of the players in Dover when I was there, including Ford. Including Ford. So why don't you finish up this stint as interim finance director? <laughs> what, what are you going for next? You're going to go for interim board of selectmen member? Uh, yeah. he, he's going to move to Dover. He's going to move. Become a board of selectmen. Show us all how you do it right. I heard that. <laughs> <laughs> Carl, thank you very much. Jerry, thank you. Thanks. Going to move to our next item, the financial progress and the goals updates. You don't even have to get up from the seat, Carl. No. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. So um, again, I'm here tonight with our treasurer collector, Jerry Lane, and remotely um, town accountant, Kathy LaPlante, and our town assessor, Amy Gao, are also here this evening. Um, and we want to provide the board with an update on a number of best practice projects that we are in the process of implementing in our finance offices and to discuss with the board the fiscal 20 audited financial statements and the manage management letter, um, should you have any questions about those documents. Almost three years ago, when um, I was here as your acting town administrator, the selectman established as one of its goals that town departments modernize and streamline operations, um, largely through the use of proven technology, where Dover was sorely behind the times. Unfortunately, uh, instead of being here tonight to be able to demonstrate to you the, the steady progress in this regard, we had two very challenging years in our accounting and treasurer's offices. I own this, um, Jerry and Kathy own this. I, I will not include the assessor's office because uh, I think they are functioning very well. Um, that being said, it's, it's, we thought it was important to share with you the progress, our progress to date um, in turning this around and our plan for the next two years. Let me first start by answering a reasonable question you may have. What happened? Um, this answer is not meant to be an excuse, um, but more reflection of some of the challenges in managing a small community. Um, so first, we had a new town accountant, Kathy LaPlante, um, who was hired following the retirement of the town's longtime town accountant. And like any key financial position, it takes time for someone new to come up to speed on the town's financial operations. Normally, this is a relatively short process. Um, most of the learning curve takes place in six to 10 months. But we didn't make it easy for Kathy, um, which is the second issue. So as Kathy was here, she came in in the middle of the fiscal year, and she's during her first six months on the job, and not only closing that fiscal year, but opening a new fiscal year, we were implementing a new accounting package, or what is known as our general ledger. Implementing a new general ledger is one of the most challenging tasks for a finance office because a town that is doing this has to maintain the role general ledger and all those records at the same time as creating and opening the new general ledger and training staff on using that, um, including, including training on that software. I've had other 
accountants say to me when I've gone through this, I'll do this once in my career. Don't ever ask me to do it again. It's that challenging. Third, we had a variety of long-term illnesses uh, during this time period. And in a small community such as ours, where we don't have much staff depth or bench strength, um, we did not have the staff resources just to manage the basic day-to-day -day financial operations. So we were quite literally in crisis mode um, and we had to hire a consultant um, for our treasurer's office and another consultant for the accounting office to get us through fiscal 20 and 21. And I can't say enough good things about the consultants who assisted us. Um, but just like when you hire new staff, it does take the time for those consultants to come up to speed as well. And then lastly, during this period, we were operating for most of the period remotely um, due to COVID, which further added a level of complexity to managing our financial operations. While all this was happening, the town administrator, rightly so, asked us to come up with a plan or a series of changes and improvements we could make so we could not only limit the likelihood of this situation in the future, but also respond to the selectman's goals of modernizing and streamlining our financial operations. So when Chris asked for that plan, um, I wanna talk a little bit about how we came up with the plan, how we identify what we were going to work work towards, and then some of the progress we've made to date. So to develop the plan of action, we first needed to evaluate our own operations. And we did this in three ways. Um, with the board's support, we invited the Department of Revenue, the Division of Local Services, to come in and undertake a financial management review of the town's operations. And I know you're familiar with that report and they're the excellent recommendations that were made as part of that report. Second, we reviewed the management letter from the town's independent auditors for the prior three years so that we could also understand and address those findings and recommendations. And finally, based on the experiences I've been fortunate enough to have in three other communities, I prepared for the town administrator an evaluation of in a series of both short term and longer term recommendations, some of which would require additional financial resources, which to date the, the board, the Warren Committee and town meeting have generous, generously supported. And I should add that each of these evaluation efforts were not necessarily duplicative, um, but they were complementary in that each looked at our financial operations through a different lens. So we did um, this evaluation and based on the findings, we came up with the following plan. Um, first, we needed to substantially realign staff tasks in the town accountant's office in the treasurer's office to use proven technology, proven technology to accomplish the work that we were quite frankly manually processing. Second, we needed to decentralize tasks in the town accountants and the treasurer's offices to give the individual town departments control over the processing of their payroll and accounts payable and provide them with online access to that data. Third, with the staff time that this will free up in, in both of those offices, the town accountant and the treasurer's office, we are redirecting the staff to address the recommendations made by the town's auditors in their management letter to the Board of Selectmen and the Department of Revenue in their recommendations to the Board of Selectmen. And lastly, we're using this technology to what I call opening the funnel. So in the past, most of the financial information that town departments needed um, relating to their finances had to be obtained by directly going to the town accountant's office or the treasurer's office. And given those offices both had limited staff, that created a narrow funnel. So now using the technology in both our payroll and general ledger software applications, departments are able to get this information directly 
in, by going into our systems, um, freeing up our staff time and giving those departments immediate access and control in accessing this information. So while we're smack in the middle of implementing these new systems, we can report to you that we have made some progress to date. All departments now have online access to their budget, their spending reports, and their revenue accounts. About half of our departments have been trained by the town accountant to directly enter their bills into their general ledger system, giving them greater control over these payments and freeing up staff time in the accounting office. And we expect the remaining, the remainder of the departments to be trained within the next two months. Beginning this past July 1st, in the treasurer's office, we implemented a lockbox payment system for real estate and motor vehicle excise bills, substantially improving the time it takes us to process these payments. And again, freeing up time in the treasurer's office. We have also modified and streamlined the process by which the trust, the treasurer processes all payments made into the town, which will allow us to close the fiscal year on a more timely basis. We are well into the first of four phases of changing the way we process employee payroll, which will provide all of our employees with online access to their pay information, their vacation accruals, their sick leave banks, their personal leave balances, something that up till now we've been having to maintain manually. And we are closing the backlog on recording all payments made to the town, which will allow us to meet our legal and audit requirements to reconcile our cash on a timely basis. So what does all this mean for you as policymakers and for our department heads? We should be able to close fiscal 21, so the year we just ended, um, much earlier than we've closed the prior two fiscal years. And I should know within the, about the next month how soon we'll be able to close fiscal 21. Um, but that, if we can tell already that we're last year we closed fiscal 21 in late May of the following year. Um, right now we have every expectation that we'll close by the end of this calendar year and probably before the end of calendar. 21. Um, that will eventually provide for a timelier certification of the town's free cash, which is an important part of the operating budget. And I know the discussions that you have with the Warren Committee and is also part of setting the tax rate every year. Um, we'll be able to provide the, the selectmen and the Warren Committee with more timely information on unexpended balances from the prior year. And we hope to have that information um, to the town administrator next week. Uh, we'll provide the selectmen, the Warren Committee and department heads with immediate access to the status of their budgets, including the status of any special warrant articles or capital articles, which in the past, again, they didn't have access to. They had to come to us and come through that narrow funnel. Uh, during the course of the fiscal year, this, these changes will provide the selectmen with more timely information of revenue collections and actual expenditures compared to budgeted amounts. Um, you will be able to look at it in real time. Um, we can provide you, if you don't want to go online, with monthly reports on both revenues and budgets, uh, budget status. And hopefully all of this will improve the confidence of taxpayers and town officials have in the management of the town's finances. And lastly, and sort of important to myself and Jerry and Kathy, this will free up badly needed staff time to address the many pressing issues raised by our auditors. Um, the details of all this are found in the best practices document that I know you have. Um, so we can answer any specific questions you may have about our plan going forward. Um, and the document is broken out into the progress we've made to date and what is on our to-do list, basically what is we're working on right now. 
I want to, though, importantly add that each of these projects that we're working on, it's not like turning on a light switch with the change being instant. It's more like rewiring your house. We have to take a detailed and methodical approach so you don't set the house on fire while you're doing the work. So with that, we're happy to answer any questions the board may have on our best practices work plan, um, the audited financial statements, or the auditor's management letter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Carl. Jerry, would you like to add anything before we begin the, the question part of it or the comment part of it? I'm not happy at the, the way things went. Um, we're working very hard to get things back on track and I'm happy to answer questions. Terrific, thank you. So I will, ju just a couple of quick comments from me. I'll have Robin go first and then Bob, then just maybe one or two questions from me at the, at the very end. But thank you for the report. It's a very succinct and detailed summary of the report, the Melanson report and the best practices report. So I've read both. I've looked through every item. And in, in my summary, I just want to begin with a couple of quick comments for the folks here, for the people listening at home, for the people who watch this on a recording. Audit reports, for though there are, I've been on a board for many, many years. I've been on as you know, know, public boards and private boards. And for those who have not been on a public board or a private board of a corporation, an audit is a very different process. And the context of an audit is very important because if you read this without any context, you see words that jump off the page at you that could mean a lot of different things. And specifically, when you look at the words that are bolded, as you've referred to, both referred to, where there's weaknesses, or there's material weaknesses, or there are deficiencies, or material deficiencies, there, in my mind, and in our board view, for me, there's nothing new here for me. For me, this is a work in progress. For the three of us, this has been a process of change that's taken place over three years and will take place over maybe four years or five years. So the context for this report, I think for those at home and those without a lot of expertise in audit reports is important because if you read it without context, you'd think, my God, there's a lot of things that could have really gone wrong. In my opinion, that's not the case. In my opinion, that this report highlights things that we have continuously worked towards. And we're not there, clearly. We have some things to do. So I'm not, I'm not surprised. And quite frankly, I'm not put off by any, any of this. So I think these everything that the report shows and highlights are things that we understand. You've articulated that tonight, Carl, and that we're working towards. So that's my context. I'd also, I like the idea of opening the funnel. I think that's something people can relate to. I remind everybody that, that improvements lead to timing, speed, and reconciliation are all part of a process that take time to get things faster without doing things incorrectly. The last thing I would just say is that the results and the and the information provided is a process of continuous improvement. And I think that we'll all benefit from that. So those are my comments. Robin, would you like to jump in? Um, sure. So, you know, many of these items on the management report have been there for a couple of years or as long as I can remember. I think what I really like about the report that Carl and the finance team has presented is their actions to finally be able to address these concerns. And that I believe reinforces everything we've been trying to do to improve processes and then to continuously improve the way we do things. So I know 
this is a slow process. I'm sure some of the changes you all have made have been a little tricky to implement. Like I noticed now that all departments were entering their own payables. And I'm sure with that, there's, you may not be entering them, but there's a review process that you have to put in place and a training process. So, you know, I think it's a step in the right direction, but you do have to put um, other checks and balances in place. So I really commend the team. Um, I would be thrilled to see us close the books before the end of the year. And it sounds like, you know, you're, you're on track to do that. So each year we can make more and more progress and with the goal of having a management letter with nothing in it. So I appreciate all the efforts of everyone. Thank you, Robin. Bob? Yeah, um, in my experience in, uh, in business, um, I was often the guy who was asked to put on the boots and the hat and cut, go into the fire, the place that was on fire, and um, and help put out that fire. Um, and it and I always, I was always surprised. I don't know why. I mean, after the second or third time, it's I should have known. Uh, we get into trouble. Most places get into trouble because they try to do too much with too few. Um, and I'm getting a sense from what you guys have said is that you were trying to do too much with too few people. And that is a, 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 the recipe for disaster. Um, good people working hard, just overwhelmed. Um, the second thing that sort of struck me about this is sort of the centralized nature of uh, the processes. And I, it's, it strikes me that it may have been uh, an attempt at quality control. Is, is that true? If you have this information filtering through one or two people, the chances of having higher quality control or the appearance of having better management control is there as opposed to, so, so that's two. Three, that leads to a question around distributed systems. I've done distributed systems. Um, and the key to distributed systems is making sure that the data input has a lot of controls around it because you know the old story, stuff in, stuff out. And when you distribute, you get Rod's point about making sure that you have strong, well-trained staff or well-trained job aids or well-designed input screens that minimize or highlight um, information that may or may not be correct. Uh, so, so, control, so, Distributed systems require high training, require job age, require high, tough, high management um, in order to make it work well. And you got to have the staffing, you have to have the staff members right. Um, and I guess, um, I guess the last question is, is sort of, we had, we've had reviews by the DOR, we've had reviews by whoever does this management letter. Um, you guys have taken a deep dive. To me, this seems to be a fundamental question of process engineering. And I don't know if we've had, for, you know, we've had people come in and look at the DOR, we've had people come in to look at various and sundry other things. I mean, this is at the base, we, it was a heavily manual process, um, relying on people doing things in the funnel. Have we looked, has anybody stepped back or thought about doing a process re-engineering study to make sure that as we go through this effort, and it's a big effort, I understand that, that we optimize the work and intelligence and knowledge of our people to truly make an effective and efficient financial uh, set of processes. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that's in there or not, but, but uh, you have that whole package has to come together in order to make sure you meet the modernization goals. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I think um, all four of your points are, are right on target. Um, I'll just briefly comment, sort of going in reverse order. So in terms of, you know, has anybody looked at our, our systems operations? Um, so I mentioned earlier about we fired two, ex, what I feel, excellent consultants who work in a number of communities, um, both the size of Dover, larger, small, and smaller. 
Um, so that is one of their tasks as well as to do that, to look at those procedures and operations. Uh, so you're absolutely right. We have to look at that. We felt it was better to have somebody who's done this in a lot of communities yep. and seeing what works and didn't work than to try to do it ourselves. Um, so I think you'll be pleased once those two consultants, you know, as they continue their training portion of their work. Um, again, working backwards, uh, both your comment and, and Ms. Hunter's about internal controls. Um, so we expect actually our internal controls will improve. You're absolutely right in that they'll improve because up to now, the, the staff who are supposed to be doing the internal control work have been doing data entry work. They've just been getting all these hundreds and hundreds of whether it's invoices or payrolls into the system and haven't had the time to do the internal control review. So when, you know, one of the first comments I made is we're completely changing the way staff assignments are, what the staff is doing. And that's the switch. They're taking away sort of that rudimentary, again, nothing more than data entry and putting their role to what it really should be, which is a internal control review. Um, so I ex actually expect that that will not only be strong, but it'll probably be stronger than we've had. Um, third, the re I think largely the reason we haven't been able to move in this direction earlier um, is because the systems we have, our own general ledger system, didn't provide for distributed input. So it had to come in through the funnel. Um, and this, you know, happened before I was here as we were acting. You know, Jerry was largely involved in this, selecting this um, new general ledger package. Um, we received a state grant, you know, that underwrote most of the cost. But, but that GL package now has given us the technology, something I remember you saying over and over and over, you know, using technology um, to be able to move to a distributed system, to move to a system that people can have access to 24-7. I mean, this resides in the cloud. You can be at home because of COVID and do your financial work or be here in town offices. Um, but that was a very challenging implementation as any GL package is when you implement it. Um, and as I mentioned, that happened during Kathy LaPlante, our town accountants, you know, her first six months and she had to bring on this new package, um, GL package, as well as maintain the old one, you know, while we made the transition. So, you know, um, the words you've said so many times this board is about, you know, are we using technology in the ways we could? Now we're, now we have that technology to use. And it's not, this isn't cutting edge. I, I remember what Ms. Hunter said when we came to you about the lockbox. She says, oh, companies have been doing this for 20 years, you know, and, and 60, <laughs> and, you know, and, you know, we were moving and, you know, part of it is it's become much more affordable for smaller communities like ours to do it. Um, but all of the technology improvements that are part of what I've discussed, this is all proven technology that's been out there for a number of years and are being used by municipalities um, in a widespread way. So, you know, when you're a small community like us, you can't be the ones to invent the wheel. I don't want to be first in line, but I'm happy to be, you know, third and fourth in line after the bigger parties bet these things and you see what their experiences are. So I have one question before I turn. <clears throat> so this is just simply because I don't know, right? This is, so I have seen an awful lot of companies sending bills to me electronically, right? So I was, I've always been curious about the best way to start is if you capture the, if you can capture the information electronically. So have you, in the vendors that we use, does this information, is the information that comes into our payables, in, invoices, et cetera, et cetera, is it electronic or is it still paper? And that has to, it's, because I've seen a big shift yeah. to electronic. It's, it is, you're right, it's clearly shifting to electronic. 
it's, um, I couldn't tell you the percentage that we now get electronically, but it's clearly shifting that way. Um, with our GL package, um, one of the uh, functions it has, we haven't purchased it yet, and it's not terribly expensive, but one of the functions it has is when we get those bills, we can then keep them electronically. Um, in the system. So the attic, which includes boxes and boxes of this type of stuff, um, should largely become, sh should largely start shrinking as, if we implement uh, electronic record keeping for our financial records. Um, the town administrator and I, was, as recently as today, we're having that discussion about, you know, do we want to purchase this additional piece of software? And if so, when do we want to implement it? Uh, but that, as you're saying, that's sort of clearly the direction that the private sector has been going in. Because that's what we tried to do. We tried to capture it once and then flow it through the system so that the, the, the amount of hands that touch it, you just increase the error rate. You don't lower the error rate. And I just don't, I didn't know if it's, it's so we used to talk with high volume users. We had a way of taking the information from their systems to our systems directly. So we cut out all the, right, all that uh, paperwork. I don't know if, because we're small, I don't know. We probably don't have that scale. But I mean, even now, cell phones, you can do an awful lot of stuff with cell phones where it's, you know, you get the bin, you pay it, it's all on, it's all done. And then it has to get it entered into the accounting system. So as you look forward, I mean, I, we should be aware of that kind of change. And if we can, model it or take advantage of that as you guys go through this exercise, or at least, to, you know, put it on a checkbox. Yep. I'm done. Thank you, John. Thank you, guys. Robin, anything else you would you like to add? No, that was a good conversation. Good questions. Oh, thank you, Jerry. Thank you. And are are we going to move on to your next item? Our next item, one three. Is it still Carl? It's we still Carl. Oh, we're we're going to keep no. This, we're not going to keep it's the Carl show. <laughs> Tim's requesting the approval of the board to enter into two agreements with Clifton Larson Allen. The first is for accounting services for the fiscal year ending 2021. The second is for an as needed professional accounting support service. Um, so I, you know, I mentioned earlier, we hired two excellent consultants to have been advising us and working with us on many of these improvements. Um, one is the um, accounting firm Clifton Larson Allen. Um, they don't do, they do, a, they did a fair amount of work for us for fiscal 20. I think we'll do less so in closing fiscal 21 because we've made so much progress, but we still wanna be able to use them because we're, because of the new systems we're bringing on, we wanna make sure we give the right, right amount of attention to all the new stuff we're bringing on. Um, and so use Clifton Larson to help us close the fiscal year. Um, so we'd like to continue using them for another year. And then in addition, as, as you mentioned earlier about sort of the training and portion of it, the, the second agreement that we asked them to drop is um, to give us just a, a price for doing some staff training as we make all these changes and improvements. Um, we know there's some be staff training that will go along with that. Um, and the, the woman we're working with, who I've worked with on a number of occasions in my other communities, is just excellent. Um, so it's both the financial work helping us close 21 is one agreement. The other one is um, a training agreement to provide us with training services. Thank you. Jerry, anything to add? No. Uh, um, thank you. Carl, so uh, this is a this is a this is the point where where oftentimes this happens where I have to say um, thank you for this and I have to disclose that unbeknownst to you, unbeknownst to Jerry, unbeknownst to Bob, Robin, Clifton Larson Allen is one of my accounting firms. So they, I I think um, and we'll I'll certainly get. Uh, clarification on this, but they're, I can tell you, they're, they're a great firm. We've used them. I, they file a tax return for one of my 
family trusts. Um, they file tax returns for me. They've done a lot of account accounting work for me. So I think I have to disclose that and then possibly recuse myself from the voting. I'm sorry? There's a document? Yeah, there's a document that I would have to disclose and make publicly aware that that they are people I'm very well familiar with because I've hired them and have a working relationship. Maybe with we them. should reconsider. I don't know. <laughs> Robin, would you like to add anything? No, I, it's it's um, it's kind of nice that you have hands-on experience with them. Bob, I, I don't. I just have a question for Chris. So as we go through just to complete this exercise, I mean, clearly we've been understaffed. So if once once things are running according to plan, is there going to be staffing, future staffing implications? in this financial department? Bob, it's hard to hear you. <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry. I just asked, there's been at the, at the uh, I don't know if I should be looking this way, Robin, or should I be looking that way? When you look the other way, I can hear you better. So speak into the microphone. Oh, well, it's right here. Maybe I have it off. No, um, what, I, what I said was um, part of the problem has been having the right number of people, trained people doing this work. And so I asked Chris that once we get through this exercise, does he foresee a staffing implication for, um, for this department in the future or not? I, uh, at, at this point, I don't, I don't foresee any staffing implications that we should be concerned about. As Carl and the team have elaborated this evening, uh, there has been a lot going on and the team has really been in crisis mode just to get up to speed, so to speak. So, uh, hope and the plan is is that as we get up to speed, as you crest, we're as okay. we leverage our new technology and we reassign and rearrange how we're operating, um, that the the staff that we have in place um, will be able to sustain the financial organization um, moving forward. I will say though, I will use this opportunity to make a plug that it has been. Uh, invaluable having an acting uh, finance director to help steer uh, and guide this work and work with our finance team um, in order to to move us forward and implement these things it is it's more than a full-time job for everybody so that's been a really helpful role uh, in which carl has been serving over the past year and a half so that sounds like a potential future staff increase. <laughs> that might be a teaser. So I believe that I can make the motion and I move to authorize Mr. Dwelly to execute all documents related to the agreements with Clifton Larson Allen for professional accounting support services. I also, again, have to disclose that it's a firm I am very well familiar with because I've used them um, significantly in the past, not for my personal tax returns, but for my family trust tax returns, my kids returns, and I have not used them in this capacity. So I think that for the purpose of this meeting, I'm going to recuse myself from this vote, but make the motion and ask for a second. Robin? I will second the motion. All in favor? Aye, Robin Hunter. Aye, Bob Springer. So moved. I think, Carl, that um, is probably make just probably crossing the T's and dotting the I's, but thank you for, for that. <laughs> Jerry, thank you. Amy, Kathy, watching at home, participating on Zoom. Thank you very much. I think we should keep Carl. Give me one point for him. I'll watch on I'll watch on Kate. You watch on YouTube or Facebook. Yeah. yeah, very, very nice. Carl will be getting some work as a result. I think he might get some. He might want to stick around. <laughs> Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Jerry. Thank you. Good night. Item one point four is our reserve policy discussion is a reserve a discussion of our reserve policy and a potential vote with Mr. Dwelly. Thanks, John. Um, so two of the goals that the Board of Selectmen have identified for uh, for this fiscal year 
are, uh, are around establish the establishment of reserve policies. Um, one being the codification or memorialization of the capital resort reserve fund that was established at this past uh, town meeting. Um, so we wanna memorialize that policy. And then the second policy is the development of a free cash policy and how the town wants to generally strive to generate free cash as well as then utilize that free cash. Um, I certainly don't have to belabor the point that free cash has been discussed quite often um, over the years. Um, so I start the process of putting together two separate working groups um, to start to develop those policies um, with the hope of getting those achieved and accomplished this year. Um, so I, I envision this as more of a general conversation um, as to, uh, you know, who the board, if anyone might be interested in assigning a, a board liaison uh, to work on these two. Um, I envision the structure on the capital side being a you know, board of selectmen liaison, a board of selectmen member, uh, the chair of the capital budget committee, a member of the warrant committee, and then we'll assign some staff resources to assist with, uh, with the development and all the work related to that. Uh, and then the same would be for uh, the free cash, um, though that would exclude uh, the capital budget member. It'd be a few people of the warrant committee, a board of selectmen member, uh, and assign some, some staff to support that. And those two working groups would work um, independently uh, to develop these policies and then move forward to present those to the warrant committee and the board of selectmen ultimately for, for approval. Okay. Yeah. Great. My, my, um, it, you know, my immediate response to that, Chris, is it's something that we, the three of us, have established as goals, objectives, priorities for every year that we've all been selectmen. So, we, everybody watching at home and participating here tonight knows that the free cash and free cash cash management, the free cash guidance that we have been giving, uh, that we took on as an initiative several years ago, free cash groups, study groups that we began some four, five years ago. Um, 2018. Are, yeah, 2018. 2018. Um, have, have really benefited. We as a town have benefited from a deeper dive into these. I think the the cash management policy of setting aside reserves is giving us a much better free cash understanding. So this is just, again, to use a phrase I think we've all used this evening is a, a continuation of our goals, objectives, and a policy towards continuous improvement in all of these items. Robin, would you like to add anything? I completely agree. She's a woman of few words tonight. I like that. <laughs> I don't know. Did you have dinner? I did. I, I, I've had a very rough week. <laughs> Would you like to have anything, <laughs> Mr. Springer? <laughs> um, so, I mean, I, I agree, John. I mean, we've made, I mean, just at the, uh, was it May? When, was it May this year when we did the cap stabilization? Or was it a year prior to that? It was this year. It was this year. So, I mean, Robin had done work on the on cap stabilization. Um, you know, I remember the presentation I looked at. I looked at the presentation before coming to the meeting tonight, and and it seems to me to make sense. I don't want to give you work, Robin, but if it's if it's budget, I, budget with I, right? I wanted to volunteer for that, especially since I'm you know on the budget on the capital budget committee, and I feel as though we've started to do some good work. So. You'll, you'll take that on? I will take that on. Thank you, Robin. Yeah, John, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say I made uh, some fairly bold statements at the May 21 town meeting about moving from budgeting to financial management. And I made some claims around free cash and, and helping people understand. So I would feel remiss if I didn't raise my hand. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Springett. I think those are both wonderful ideas, and, and I thank you very much, both of you, for uh, the willingness to do that. And I think everyone knows, and every, anybody who has followed us, the, this particular board, for the past several years knows where we stand on 
the constitution of free cash and where we stand on the policy and the guidance of our, our the money we bring in, the money we spend, and the money that we put in reserve and that we allocate for future expenses. Because as we have all said individually and collectively, cash is not free. It's money that has been spent. <laughs> not, don't necessarily spend. It's money that has invested and allocated for the benefit of everyone. And our job in the management and the fiduciary duty that we have is to do it in the most prudent, impactful way. So that always being our guiding principle is what we try to do. So it's a continuation of that. So I think, John, in the, in the municipal world, I call them encumbering. I think you encumber so that you can have the money there when you need to spend it. Yeah, we are in, we've said it many, many times with when this whole process, this pandemic took everyone off of their feet, we, the town of Dover, were in just a unique strength, position of strength, because we had such a strong cash position and such a strong free cash position. It has served us extremely well in difficult times, and I think it's going to continue to do the same. So Tough thank to you. get in trouble with a strong cash balance. Absolutely. So Chris, how do you see this going forward? Is, are you going to organize the, the, the first several meetings or the first meeting? That's right. Yeah. So I'll reach out to the two groups, um, and get everyone together, solicit some dates for us to have a first sit down. Uh, in that meeting, I'll also provide um, everybody with a, with a draft policy. So as you recall, um, part of our work two years ago was to uh, engage with the state to develop a suite of best practice policies, some of which we've implemented internally, and then the other reserve ones um, we've just kind of had in the stable waiting for us to get the groups together to have these. So it'll be a good starting point for us to have a conversation about what might be the best fit for building. So when we did the, uh, when Robin did the presentation, I think it was in, whether it was 2020 or 20, when I was 2020 or 2021, I forget. We also talked about open space stabilization account. Is that going to be part of this? Is that going to be just a follow on? So it's going to be a follow on. Yeah, so that's going to be uh, separate. Um, so Courtney Starling, the town's uh, land use director and planner, um, is working on developing a suite of potential opportunities that the town can use um, to make investments in, uh, in open space. So it'll be more of a, her work will be more of a, a menu or suite of things that the town could pursue rather than just the establishment of one single policy, which she will present uh, to the board this year. So I'm, I'm talkative tonight. Last one, OPEB stabilization account. What's, what's, hap what's the deal with that? Yeah, so we'll, we're refreshing that. We've got our data, the latest actuary from the schools. Um, so we'll refresh the board's policy, um, which I think was 50 or 60 percent funded. That was the, the target goal that the board established in 2018. Um, so we're going to refresh all of that, and that'll be incorporated as part of the budget setting process for this year. And the finance team is is working on all that right now. Hey, so, Robin, that was that's it, right? Those were the four we talked about. Yeah, Bob. In in two that we were on on on, on two thousand in two thousand eighteen. We had four warrant articles that we proposed, and they were open space, OPEB, stabilization, and uh, free cash. So we had, um, we, at that particular 2018 town meeting, we took two of the items off of the warrant, and right, uh, right. we focused on yep. OPEB, yep. we focused on free cash. Okay. So. That's Capital fun. stabilization came back as the work we did in 19 and 20 yeah. with Robin and I, and then well, you, Rob, you, Rob and I, as we've all rotated off these and on to others. But essentially, for those who are still following along at home, those four have never changed. So the four being OPEB are, and again, these are all items that we, back in the beginning of from 17 to 18, established as items that will always be a need for the town to address and that we should as part of our prudent long-term capital guidance and management have a stabilization fund because many towns have them and we don't we've always we prior to us establishing them we never did robin anything you'd like to add to that i pretty much no 
No, I, I mean, I just think it's, I, I like that we continue to work on all of these and we continue to refine them and we continue to evaluate whether or not they make sense for the town and how we should tweak it for the best benefit of the town. Agreed, thank you. So there is no motion needed on that. We can move to item one. It said reserve policy discussion and potential vote. There's no vote needed. No. Okay. It says so at the bottom of the screen. If there's any contention between members as to who wants to serve on a particular There's order. never, <laughs> ever, never. I can renominate you. <laughs> but he'll refuse, I think. I <laughs> In town meeting, we've all, for the past six years, we have all taken our turns defending our free cash position. Uh, item one five is goal setting software presentation. And our presenter for that this evening is our municipal project manager, Mr. Dave Sullivan. Thank Dave, how much. are you, sir? Excellent, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Do you like being back in the Great Hall rather than being Great. I love the uh, hybrid meeting. It's working out well, so couldn't be happier with that. Sure so do it right up to his room. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, let me share my screen. So Dave, how yes, long did it take you to wrink to get the wrinkles out of this process, this system? To get the wrinkles You're out of this system? Enjoying the uh, you know, anything with AV, you're always going to have some wrinkles. So there's been some testing and we've gone back and forth, but uh, we didn't test earlier this week, and I'm pretty happy with the way it turned out. So, you remember the first one that we did? The first, at least the first one that I know that we did. Here, we, remember we, we yeah we, we got we got very yeah we decided to meet in the in the great hall, and I think the the equipment had just arrived. I'm not sure it was even set up. Ah, so you we had a little feedback problem, I think. Right. To, so then we tried cell phones, then we tried, it was, it was just a mess. Well, now we have it ironed out. So yeah, it know. seems to be working quite well. Yeah, it's, it's definitely, yeah. it. don't, don't jinx me on my first uh, go through. So, all right, let's go. <laughs> all right. So let me share my screen here and we can talk about some goal set. Uh,
folks who've seen it that know Bricky. I first did me. I apologize. So Jerry is in the bottom. Yeah, Jerry. Carol. Yeah. And then our presentation. Here we go. The sound came back now. I think I know, but I'll have to, I'll have to check with me. Uh, I'm going to hold off on presenting. Uh, so apologize for that. Uh, so where I was, uh, so I came to uh, Smartsheets because of the user experience the interface. Uh, I think I went over that. It's the uh, same as any spreadsheet. Uh, it's default, one of its default views is a Gantt chart, which uh, meet, really meets our goals and needs, uh, especially for uh, showing, uh, <clears throat> for showing uh, goals and projects across multiple years and also across multiple departments. Uh, the ability to embed the charts on the web page and uh, in presentations, the integration with the existing Google Workspace business suite as well, uh, and collaboration and roll up. So, really uh, met the needs for the goal setting software. And in addition, there are some other features that really, uh, I think, put it over the edge and are nice to have and kind of a bonus for us. Uh, so one of those features is really a dynamic dashboard uh, that can you can have charts, graphs, links, and images. So uh, in your package, you can see I created a well monitoring dashboard. So this has uh, every time uh, Carl goes out and measures the wells, it updates and then uh, puts, pushes it to the dashboard. Uh, also, you can have multiple data sources and departments can roll up onto one dashboard. And there is a no code application that allows uh, people uh, such as Carl in the field to gather the data and it actually goes directly into uh, smart sheets and then up to the dashboard. So, so as I looked at the five, like I said, smart sheets really seem to be the one that meets our needs. Very easy to use. I think we can have great adoption with it and it meets the needs of showing uh, projects and goals across departments and across years as well. Terrific. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, David. Robin? I am a big Smartsheets fan. I actually use it. Um, Mr. Springett's wife is a whiz at Smartsheets. It's, um, it's, it's a really easy tool. It's on the web. Um, Numerous people, if you have the right kinds of licenses, can update it. You can attach documents. As Dave mentioned, you have um, different views that you can show information in. You can create um, Gantt charts, you know, dashboards. It's, it's, it's a great tool. So I will I will emphasize the point that Mr. Springett's wife is a, <laughs> is the expert with Smartsheet. Mr. Springett, on the other hand, not so much. But I, but it, it is a fantastic. I mean, from what I see, what she's what my wife has told me, it's a fantastic tool. Has a lot of of applications, and uh, hopefully we can take maximum advantage of it. Thanks, Dave. Robin, does Cindy use it to track Bob's? tasks and goals and to-do lists? Is that how you know she's really, really good at it? No, I know she's really good at it because I introduced her to it and then she got a lot better at it than me. <laughs> so I moved to authorize the town administrator to execute documents related to the statements of work provided by Smart Sheets Inc. Ask for a second from Ms. Hunter. I'll second that. All in favor, aye, John Jeffries. Aye, Robin Hunter. Aye, Bob Springett. David, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Greatly appreciated. Thank you. Item six is a discussion on the remaining one, on remaining a one precinct in the town of Dover. Our presenter for this process this evening is none other than our town clerk, Ms. Felicia Hoffman.
Hello, Felicia. How are Hello. you? Hello. Very well. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here this evening. So we talked a lot through the past year and a half about the fact that Dover had grown and we had a lot of voters and we probably were going to end up being two precincts. And there was a lot of background work done. How do we split the town? How do we make it equitable? How do we keep things fair? Um, but I'm very happy to report that our numbers came in lower than I anticipated. So the state will allow us to remain one precinct if we so choose for the next 10 years. I see no uh, reason not to do it. I see no advantage to split into two. So I'm hoping you all agree and will vote to execute documents for that. So we dipped under 6,000 according to the census. They allocate people slightly differently than the boots on the ground clerk does, for which we're very thankful. <laughs> yeah, I like having the one precinct, though. It works well. Robin, would you like to add anything? I'm smiling. I think it's great news. As do I. So here's my final question. You couldn't have gotten a better slot than 1.6 on tonight's agenda? Uh, I will look at our town administrator for <laughs> thanks for that. Wow. The bus. He asked for it. <laughs> hey, I was trying to give you a little lightweight stuff. You have a lot of heavy stuff to deal with. Uh, Felicia, would you like our signature on this this evening? How would you, what would you Yes, prefer? so there are some documents here that Kate has, I believe, that can be signed tonight. Oh, I do. I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make the motion, and then I'm gonna sign this, and I'm gonna have Bob sign it, and then we can have you can, uh, Robin can sign it. Russell her. Yes. That's Russell terrific. Her. Thank you. I move to petition the Commonwealth that the, that the town of Dover remain a one precinct town, and ask for a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. John Jeffries. Aye. Robin Hunter. Hi, Bob Springett. So moved. So Felicia, I have signed this. Ask Bob for a signature and one more. Uh, one more. That way, Mona will have one less thing that she'll have to track us down for tomorrow. You need another one. So there are two documents that you're going to sign. Kate will send around the packet at the end of the, oh, okay. the yeah. meeting. So I'm going to let Kate keep the paperwork. Okay. We got the motion. We're, we're good. We're good? Thank yep. You're perfect. Okay. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you, Felicia. Should have known Kate would be right on top of this and have everything at our disposal. We Item precinct. 17. Appoint the Planning Board Associate Member, Scott Friedman, as a full member. Anything to add? Or just, can we just, no, just when a, when elected bodies have a vacancy um, on their body, uh, they can either choose to wait until the next election to fill that, or the board of selectmen can make an appointment to fill the remainder of that individual's term. The planning board is recommending uh, that the board appoint um, the associate member Scott Friedman. So it should be the 2022 town election. Um, that is. Correct. Correct. So the summary is due to the resignation of Carol Cherico, the planning board is, has available a vacant seat as a full-time member. Land use director Courtney Starling is recommending that the selectmen appoint associate member Scott Friedman to the planning board as a full member until the, Mr. Springett, 2022 town election. That's the old editor, John. God, the, never the grumpy <laughs> editor, just when I, it's, when it's pointed at me. <laughs> I move to appoint Planning Board Associate Member Scott Friedman and to thank Scott for his willingness to do this as a full member to the Planning Board until the 2022 town election and ask for a second. Second. All in favor, aye, John Jeffries. Aye, Robin Hunter. Aye, Bob Springett. So moved. Scott, thank you very, very much for your service.
discussion of the water resource, the water request for qualifications in the RFQ. Thanks, John. Uh, so this past town meeting, uh, the town appropriated a hundred thousand dollars for us to engage a uh, a water consulting uh, consultant slash engineering for, firm to help the town and the board assess its existing uh, water service delivery infrastructure and make both short and long term recommendations to ensure that the town has. Um, reliable source of, uh, of water. And uh, to get that process started, uh, we have drafted a request for qualifications, which is a solicitation uh, for firms to respond back with uh, uh, essentially a scope of work uh, or a proposal on how they would accomplish uh, this work for the town. Um, while we're not obligated to undertake a traditional procurement process, um, I thought it was in the town's best interest to do so this time. So we've structured this request for qualifications twofold. One is again, inviting uh, interested parties to submit a proposed scope of work, a scope of engagement, and then secondarily uh, to then invite them in for interviews uh, with a panel that will be made up of, of a few community members and staff um, and then taking both of those things into consideration, the interview and the firm's proposal, um, that committee will then vote on who they think is the best fit for uh, the community. So I wanted to just share with the board uh, the RFQ um, that we've drafted um, so that you had an opportunity to review it and discuss it. Um, Robin, um, as, the, as the board's uh, water liaison, uh, has worked with me on this. Um, she's seen this, it's been solicited to some others in the community for uh, their feedback. Um, and unless there are any additional comments um, from the board this evening, um, we consider this ready to, ready to hit the street. Robin, seeing where this is something that you have been the liaison to, I'll ask you if there's, you have anything from your perspective that you'd like to add. I don't, I, Jerry's raising his hand. I, you know, we, Chris and I reviewed it and then we got input from um, Ron Myrick. Um, he reviewed it for us and provided us with some comments. He also offered to, you know, sit on the panel to, um, to interview these candidates. Thank you. Bob? No, I, um, I was, I think it's a big piece of work. Um, I was a little pleasantly surprised to see you guys think you can hit the, the uh, 2023 uh, town meeting. Um, we don't know, but we're going to try. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what I know. I think, I think the let, you know, obviously you lay this stuff out and, and uh, you give it your best shot. But it, that was a pleasant surprise. Because it is, um, it's a, and I'll, we'll put an asterisk on that one, uh, and we'll see how this thing goes because it's a complex uh, question. Yep. Thank you. Our chairman of the board of health, Jerry Clark, has his hand raised. No, I'm, I'm a little bit curious. I, in looking at page three, where it discusses meetings. There seems to be an omission because earlier in the document, it clearly recognizes that the Board of Selectmen have legal responsibility only over what is known as the Dover Water Department, which is the some 78 homes and or businesses connected to the infrastructure that pre-existed. And that the public water supply entities, of course, are responsible only to the state, but that the Board of Health is the predominant entity with responsibility and, and regulation over some 70% of the community. And there's no discussion whatsoever in this whole document about interacting with the Board of Health. And that furthermore, it seems strange that some of the matters to be reviewed 
already have been reviewed. So I, I'm just curious at the way this document came to be because this is the, when it showed up in the agenda two days ago, it was the first time I was even aware of this. Mary, document. I sent this document to you a few weeks ago to ask you for comments. Well, I'm. You would not believe the queue no, maybe that exists in my three email government email right. mailboxes between yeah, I, EPA. I will go back and look through, and it, it, it could be, ma'am. But all I can tell you is, I spend ten to twelve hours a day, as I did today, as I did yesterday, just trying to keep up with matters. So unless someone really knocks on the door or makes a point of saying, did you read this email? There are some things I admit I will not get a chance to see. I'm gonna let Chris. But that doesn't address the questions that I've raised. So, so the question that, uh, that Jerry's raised here about the inclusion of the Board of Health, uh, the, the meetings communication, this, this, you know, the, the expectations and objectives is, uh, is a general overview, right, of what the, the town is looking for, right? It's not a definitive contract. It's not all-inclusive or extensive. It's not meant to list out every single thing that, you know, or every single person that, uh, that this entity would engage with or work with. They will certainly be in touch and work with the Board of Health as it relates to the Board of Health's yeah. purview over, uh, over water matters. Yeah. So, um, you know, I'm certainly confident. Uh, yeah. May, if I would point out under objectives on the same page, um, with all there's a curious omission, Chris, that if you were looking for a regional partnership and or a major municipal supply, because of the act of the legislature of 1986, to which Dover is a, a, a beneficiary and subsequently a signatory to agreements, that would be from the Elm Bank. Right, but Jerry, we're just trying to get a master, you know, to put everything that all of us or some of us have put it into one document and have a master well, plan. I, I'm not disagreeing. I would just hope it would be correct. <clears throat> correct. So, Jerry, thank you for your comments and I, I agree with Robin and I agree with Chris that the, the scope and the purpose of the presentation this evening is to have a general understanding from our perspective of exactly the items that we will be looking into. I don't think there's, there's, there's I think the legal, I think the legal technical term for what you're saying is you're you're arguing facts that are not in dispute at this level so i'm going to move on or i don't think there's anything that we can discuss further um chris anything to add no nope, unless the board any other comments um if not um, we'll move forward with uh getting this uh issue and no, i'm good <clears throat> thank you robin thank you jerry thank you for your comments item 1-8 Discussion of, I'm sorry, on nine. one nine. Discussion regarding temporary water technical assistance. Thanks, John. Um, Chris. So as we talk about uh, long-term water efforts and longer-term um, consulting and engineering engagements, um, we are still operating here in town um, with uh, the public water supplier overseen by a, a private company that is still delivering discolored water throughout throughout their system uh, and the board has been quite active and proactive in engaging our state partners our legislative delegation the utility companies and doing everything that can be done to to help resolve this issue um, your work has resulted in a, a corrective action plan that was issued to colonial water by the dep uh, for them to evaluate their system um, and implement recommendations as it relates to the is that, is that in process pause. it is in process yep um, but as we've gone through this um, you know one of the things that um, that we've had conversations about is um, the benefit that a temporary short-term engagement 
if a water consultant could provide to the town as we are having conversations with the DEP, with the DPU, with Colonial Water Company to make sure that essentially everything that possibly can be done is being done. And so my thought here and what I wanted to propose to the board um, is to consider engaging the short term, very short term consultant to help work with us as our third party independent individual to assess all the work that is being done um, by Colonial Water Company, their third party consultant, as well as the work being done um, by the DEP and DPU. Uh, almost a, you know, I envision this individual or entity as, a, as an advisor to us who might be able to help us look for areas that perhaps haven't been looked at by, by others, if they exist. Maybe they don't, but that's what I wanted to, to raise to the board for your consideration this evening. I have had uh, informal conversations with some firms um, that the town has worked with in the past. Um, engagement like this is estimated to be about a maximum of 100 hours um, at a rate of around $200 per hour. So, Chris, and my view is that we have been dealing with water issues for a long time. And we're getting, we are, I, I'm asked about our water issues on a weekly basis. Um, I'm asked about follow up with Denise's office, with Secretary Senator Rush's office, with the DEP. Um, I just have, am on a weekly basis, people ask me. And I'll let Bob and, and Robin speak to this personally, where we are as the executives of the town. I view this as a industry expert or as a subject matter expert that as we saw and heard reports earlier this evening, when Carl Valenti was our interim uh, administrator, one of the things that he brought to us was industry with expertise within a very specific defined vertical. He brought us a number of different things that we were as a town unaware of. Industry experts in our, in my tenure in, in serving on boards have always served us very well, have, can serve you very well. Not obviously always serving you very well, but can serve you very well. And I like the idea of limiting the engagement to $20,000 or something along those lines is, usually money very well spent, especially when our constituent and us as the executives have limited bandwidth to be able to follow up on the things that our colonial water liaisons are providing or should be providing to us in a timely, in a timely manner. So I think this is very similar to what we heard from earlier this evening when we were able to utilize resources that Carl Valenti has brought to us. Robin? No, I agree. Bob? Um, I think that what I hear from residents is resolution. Um, what they're most interested in is solving the problem. And I don't see how this advances that particular agenda because as we've gone through the E. coli situation, and as we've gone through discolored water situation, the power to be in, in the sense of overseeing a public water utility is the DEP. Um, and um, I'm sort of reluctant, you know, from a political perspective to sort of question, I mean, I've done everything that, that um, according to them, are legally possible to do. Um, quite frankly, um, and I've mentioned this a couple of times, I think the only way to get to resolution is to take that $20,000, hire a litigator, and file suit against Colonial Water and asking and telling them that, you know, unless and until they can actually improve their service quality to the town of Dover, we're going to move to and join them from adding any clients 
um, until they can get the get the um, get the situation controlled. So I, I think it's a good idea. I think in a normal circumstance, hiring an expertise to advise is is the right thing to do. I just don't see it adding value in this particular case because this, the issue is solving the problem, and the right people with the right authority and the right power have been. Um, engaged in doing that since June. So for the people, the residents who are dissatisfied, and I'm one of them because, you know, I get my water from Colonial Water and it is various shades of gray and black and yellow. Um, I, I think that that um, you gotta be much more aggressive with the company. They drag their, they, they simply, either they don't have the resources, they may have the intent, but it's, it's really time to sort of bring them to the table. And, and uh, I don't see this as moving in that direction. So, you know, keep in mind, Bob, that they're in the process of going through a merger. And, and I believe, um, if I recall, that is supposed to be done by November. And I'm going from memory, so I could be wrong because I went to look at the Aquarian website. Um, you know, for me, just hiring our own person is just to make sure that everything that can be done is being done, just another set of eyes, um, just to show that, you know, we, we, are, we are trying to make sure that both the regulators and Colonial are doing everything they possibly can. You know, Chris, I know, reached out to the DPU as well to talk about what they may be able to do. Denise has been really um, active in trying to help the residents of Dover with this. Um, you know, I, I wanted to ask the question if the flushing helped anybody. You know, I, I don't have brown water because I have a whole house filtration system. Even though I'm served by Colonial, my filters are brown. Yeah, I, um, again, Robin, from my perspective, um, if I was sitting in the DEP or I was in the DPU, I would not see this in favorable light. You, when you say this, Bob, what do you mean? When Hiring you say, like, a consultant to sort of go over the work that they have gone through. It's like having an audit of their work. Well, it's, it's, it's another set of eyes to see if somebody else sees something that we can go to them and say, do you think this might work? Did you think about it? I agree. I, I see it along the same lines as Robin. I think that that we, if we were, so I think what we're all hearing and all experiencing from our neighbors, all three of us are colonial water uh, customers, and we, the executives, represent the town, which is also a colonial water customer. Yep. So, so we have individual. We we come to it with individual bias. We come to it with we we come to this with a a set of facts that we may or may not be frustrated about. And as you, you've you articulated, Bob, you want to take action that maybe may <laughs> result in legal or, or begin the process of legal action. That may be something we decide to do both individually, collectively, and together as a town. So all of those are options. I, I like the idea of we then, if we do that, we also have to justify and rationalize to the town spending the town dollars to go down that that's not what well. i'm suggesting i'm suggesting residents who are customers do that not the town not we the town okay so because and we could do it on their behalf but it's not yeah, but the town has a responsibility to the center of town this is this is you know the town is a customer as well yeah, and the customer you know, we have employees in the townhouse. And so we're trying to address some of the issues that we're seeing in our municipal buildings. Yes, but there are proposals for additional use of the system 
And if the current system isn't, isn't providing clear water, according to the EPA, it's safe water. Um, I just think that all residents would be better off if we um, stop that growth until we proved that the water is not just safe, but also clean. And I, and again, we can, we can oh, if we don't- Bob, the DEP said the water was safe and clean. It's just discolored. Yes, safe, they say. Um, clearly not clean because I have experienced not clean um, in the last two weeks. So um, if we wanted, if we can disagree, I just don't see how spending money on another consultant to review the work of professionals who are charged with the responsibility of doing this work is an, is an ad. Well, as I said, I'm looking at it as just somebody else giving us potential suggestions of how this issue may be rectified. Like, that's yeah, if I may, I, I didn't envision it necessarily or primarily as you know solely reviewing what the DEP puts forward or what Colonial Waters companies, third party consultant puts forward. You know, I viewed it, you know, as a as a resource to help us, right? So we talked about, you know, filtration systems, or Robin mentioned her filtration system today. You know, perhaps there is an opportunity or opportunities out there where maybe that is the best path forward, right? Uh, but we don't have that those technical resources right at our at our disposal to help us work through some of these other potential solutions that maybe others have not thought about. Maybe they will, right? When they come out of colonial waters, engagement. I, I don't know. But the thought was is that it might be beneficial for us as a community to have on a very limited basis and small dollar technical resource available to help us work through or answer any questions that we may have as it relates to the strictly the, the discoloration um, issue at hand. Alternatively, we, we could wait, right? We could wait until we go through the RFQ process for our longer term consultant, right? And also have them also, you know, assist us in a technical capacity. If this thing is still ongoing, it's just, you know, we, we are three to four months in now on this. It was June, it's, right? It's been a long time. The other, the other part is we might not have a long-term consultant on board until December. You know, at the earliest. Oh, at the earliest. That's okay. what we're targeting. So, so we're targeting December. And your neighbors, my, me, you, we think about Robin. We've had, we've been dealing with this as customers for months, and our constituents are constantly voicing displeasure, right? So we... So, so John, I come back. The issue is solving the problem. I yeah. don't see how this step so moves us to solve the problem. Because, because Colonial is re responds only to the DEP. And Colonial has given us many reasons why, even from a flushing standpoint, that they can't do the things that are the right, but we can't. There's no way we can force them to do that. It's I, only the DEP. I think what this will do is help us move the timeline along. I don't see that. So we can just disagree, it could or, or it could, right? It, you know, we could engage us, and it could come back, and you know, everything that's being done is is what it is. And unfortunately, this is a longer term solution. I, I mean, that could come back. That is certainly a possibility. But. You know, that's the question that I wanted to pose to the board is given our current circumstances, did, did the board think that this was- We have two yeses and a no. Of interest, so. I, yeah, we have two two yeses and a no. Do you, do you need a motion for us to- It's entirely up to the board. If a board member wants to make a motion to authorize me to move forward with and to engage a short-term consultant for this at a potential cap, if you want. Alternatively, if there's no motion, then that speaks for itself on like how you want to press it. 20,000 approximately but i would like yeah approximately what if it came back is you you if it couldn't be done for 20 no, that's, this is different right this isn't good this is a different consultant to come in 100 hours at 200 bucks an hour is twenty thousand dollars this is not with the this is separate from yeah 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 okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Th this is 
approximately. Right, right, approximately. Robin, do you have do you have a, a, any other questions, concerns, comments? No, and I, I, I just, I, I think, I think. I believe you and I are on the same page. I just think another set of eyes, um, somebody else looking at the situation may shed some light and maybe not. And if they can't, it's it's only going to be four or five hours of work. Yeah, I, I just reiterate, Bob, when, when we are looking at possible litigation or possible a possible legal approach, whether it's individually as 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 taxpayers, or I mean, as ratepayers to colonial customers, as customers, customers, as customers, customers to colonial, or as the executive of the town, I, I want to be sure. I would like to be sure that there is something we've missed, and that there isn't a process that we may have benefit from, because litigation is expensive. Whether we take it on an individual basis or we take it as a town or we do it together, it's going to be expensive. So I, I am going to make a motion that we allow Mr. Dwelly to enter into conversations with a with consulting firms for the purpose of a short term water consultant for no more for an amount no more than $20,000 and ask second for that. Robin, I second that. Second. All in favor? Aye, John Jeffries. Aye, Robin Hunter. Uh, no, Bob Springer. So thank you very much. And Chris, we're going to move to item number 10. Calendar events. So the calendar events lists key events and working dates used by town departments and boards and committees in the planning process. Um, there, I'm not going to ask Dave to share the screen in the event that God, no. <laughs> there is a malfunction and that we get eliminated. I would suggest that anybody watching this evening or watching us on, on a, uh, on our Facebook recording, go to the town website, Kate, where this is live right now. Okay. Yep, we're on Facebook Live, we're on DC, DSC TV, DSC TV Live, all the channels. Yep. So we're out there. We're out there. And this is out there. The this is out there. The packet is out there. Is out there. The yep. And available on the website. Yep. I move to approve the calendar events for October 2021 through June 2022. And ask for a second. I'll second that. All in favor, aye, John Jeffries. Hi, Robin Hunter. Hi, Bob Springett. So moved. Thank you very much. Item 11. Provide dates, uh, updates on any of the ongoing projects for the Board of Selectmen. There are agendas, Chris, anything that we would like, are we adding um, in the, obviously in the packet, but there's a, is there anything that we need to announce other than what's here and what's in the packet and the same rules apply as we just mentioned? Yeah, that's it. Or, the only other thing is just a reminder that one of these October meetings will slot in that, that follow-up discussion on the borrowing conversation related to the community center. Most likely the October 21st? Most likely. Most likely. Right, and that makes sense based upon the timeline that Bob provided. Bob, anything to add to this? No. And remind to, her, uh, to everyone watching at home that the Dover Board of Selectmen meeting projected agenda items are on the town's website. Potential uh, proposed meetings projected October 7th, 21st, September 4th, and November 18th. No motion needed. Item 12, town administrator updates, Chris. Thanks, John. Two very quick things. Um, the first is, uh, despite the little hiccup, uh, about 30 minutes or so ago, Dave was being modest. I just want to thank him and recognize him for tying all this together. Uh, it's an actually incredible amount of effort that goes into making a hybrid meeting work and connecting all these things. You figure you just plug a couple of switches in and it happens, but it is a lot of work. So 
kudos to Dave for uh, for getting it done and making it happen. And uh, and Rick, you too behind the behind the screen filming on uh, on our behalf here for uh, Dover Sherburn Cable TV. So uh, those guys did a lot of work to make this happen. So I, I appreciate their efforts. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, so they were tricking me being at home because when you talk, it shows up both on Zoom and on Dover TV, and the screens are flipped. <laughs> so you just wanted to be a TV star. Is that the deal? It's I, well, I kept. I kept thinking mine wasn't set up right. So I have, it's, it just was freaking me out at first. <laughs> yeah. Just a quick project update for the board as it relates to the highway uh, garage solar project. As you recall this past May, we got approval uh, from town meeting um, to enter into a pilot agreement um, with a solar company for a solar project at the highway garage. We put that forward in anticipation based on the board's vote a while back to move forward with a solar project, a roof array at the highway garage. Um, as you recall, part of that presentation that Select, the solar company gave to the board um, was that it would be essentially an all inclusive project that they'd come in to get it, you know, they'd be able to get it done and would be able to see, you know, certainly both the financial and the energy efficient um, green energy benefits from the project. Um, one thing that came up during the due diligence of the project um, was that uh, a structural analysis of the roof, um, which is getting close to being 20 years old now and no longer has a warranty on it. Uh, so entering into a 20 year lease to have a solar array on the roof, you want to make sure that your roof underneath is able to sustain that because if, you know, God forbid there's a roof leak or the roof caves in again, um, you know, any downtime on the system is going to going to cost the town money. Um, so we made the decision that it made sense to essentially reinforce the roof uh, with a rubber membrane that would give you uh, another at least 25 years guaranteed of roof life uh, on there. Uh, problem with procurement arose with that um, in that um, it was explained to us that that roof augmentation would be able to be folded in to the solar project that the solar provider would be able to fold that in to their their overall project and then just reduce the amount of money that they pay toward that off of our PPA rate. Um, since that time, the company has a new legal counsel whose opinion on that differs from the company's. Um, so we're not the only guys who differ occasionally. So yeah. So they're presently where we are at is uh, select the company, uh, the um, power options, uh, which essentially is like the state entity that oversees this work and authorize it, um, is working um, to essentially determine whether or not select can in fact just include that roof repair as part of the procurement. If it's not possible, um, what we will then have to do is, you know, I'll come back to the board. We'll give you an update on the project, on the figures, and then ask you if you would like to move forward making a request at town meeting because we'd have to make a, a funding request for the roof repair um, in order to get that done. So, Chris, when do you think when do you meeting. think that might happen? Uh, I heard from um, I heard from some folks today um, that we should be hearing in the next week or so on definitively from the state which path they're able to take related to this so i'll give you an update then but i did want to provide you because it's been a it's been a couple of months now without a, without an update on that project so and we'd have to have a, a another we'd have to have a town meeting approval is that what you said if we needed to go through the procurement and pay for the roof repair right. ourselves we'd have to request the funds at town meeting yep um any other questions on the solar project okay and then uh my last update actually is a deferral over to Kate. I think Kate's got a couple of things that she wanted to share with the board. Thanks, Chris. Um, so I'm happy to announce that our community newsletter collaboration effort has launched and uh, we're teaming up with some of our very dedicated town volunteers in particular right now, Ruth Townsend, she'll be 
creating and collecting she doesn't all have the, she doesn't have enough to do on one account. more thing on her list of uh, things to do but we're very happy that she um, has stepped forward so she'll be uh, collecting information from boards committees departments the school administration really any town related news so tonight we really want to uh, reach out and ask for boards and committees and departments to send Ruth um, any any information they want in the upcoming November newsletter. The deadline is October 15th. Um, and all this information is on uh, the town website. It's the first news item right when you sign on. Um, and Ruth's email address is there. And also information on ideas of some of the information we're looking for as far as boards and committee highlights, any vacancies, um, any meetings coming up that you want to advertise. Um, and we're also one of the goals is to link everything in this electronic newsletter to our website. So if anyone has any questions, they can um, contact me, but all the information is our first news story on, on the website. That's terrific. And it'll be digital. Robin wants a, you know, mail out newsletter. She <laughs> likes the mail out newsletter. I do, but See? I'm... I, I oh. actually do, but um, I also like electronic newsletters. Just for Robin. Robin should get a special copy. I can print it. Pick it up. That's the only oh, caveat. That's so, the only way they'll get me in there to sign stuff. So, so Kate, the only thing I would ask ask Ruth, so it should be it's it's important to have elements that are of interest to the community, not just of interest to us insiders. Mm -hmm. Yes, point taken. Yeah, and she I, and I think she's really on the beat of that. Yeah, too. so she's she's all over the place. She's she's a good person to. Uh, she's a hard worker. She's really good, and really and she's the main connected. goal is to have a consolidated place. Yep. You know, to to get all the updated information. Yep. Terrific. We should have the cutest dog competition. <laughs> That's a good cutest idea. Dog. Cutest dog, dog yes. competition. Yes. I I'll vote leave, for a, I'm going to leave that alone. <laughs> somebody who lives on near me. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, we're going to move to the I'm sleeping now. right there. There's Robin. There's lots and lots and lots of liquor licenses. Again, there you'll be very, very pleased to know that we have one day licenses for September 20th, 21st. 22nd, 25th, 26th. The 26th, Robin, is a one-day liquor license for Boston College Law School that Jim Rapetti is inviting you to. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's interest in Boston College, Any for people interested in Boston College Law School at the Connor Center, and you're invited. It's the first Why? one you've been invited to. They're uh, 26. You haven't, John, and I have. <laughs> <laughs> Boston College invites me to everything else, not the law school. The 30th, October 2nd, 8th, and 10th. Open session meeting and the minutes for August 5th, 19th, and August 26th. Thank you, Mona, very much. And I I'll move come over to sign them, Mona. Thank you. Kate's got the packet we'll sign this evening and leave everything for your signature. I move to approve the consent agenda as presented. Ask for a second. Second. All in favor? Aye, John Jeffries. Aye, Robin Hunter. Aye, Bob Springett. So moved. We are completed for the evening. So, Rick, thank you very, very much. Back in the green room. Dave. Thank you for all of you watching at home. Thank you. I will apologize for sound and attention to the, we will bring attention to uh, sharing the screen and figure out exactly how to do that. And I will also mention to those that this type of meeting is probably going to be the norm going forward. And also to should anticipate that the three of us or the six of us or the seven of us won't be here from time to time. So they'll, we're gonna utilize the remote option uh, for us to keep things moving as, as smooth as possible. We're also gonna figure out the mask issue 
This evening, we elected, for those of us who are vaccinated and social distance in the Great Hall, have not had masks on. We felt that with the mask, there may be an issue of hearing us clearly. So we're going to address that as well, come to some type of a, an agreement as to how that will work going forward. I hope everyone was able to hear us clearly and anything else. I'm going to wish everyone a good night and ask for adjourn. Make a motion. And I'm going to make a motion. Thank you to adjourn. <laughs> ask for a second. 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 Ask for a second. Second. All in favor, aye, John Jeffries. Aye, Robin Hunter. Aye, Bob Springett. Good evening, everyone. We are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.